Please, won't you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together find their way into the heart of God this morning. Amen. Saint uh, Saint Pat K, are you here? Are you here? Is that you? Yes, I can. Saint Pat K made a profound statement yesterday on the sacred text of Facebook about the parents who are grumbling with each other about online school. And I promised it would make it into today's sermon. So in St. Pat Kay's epistle to the Wachusets, she said this, when did everything become so black and white? We need more chill. We need more chill. The Israelites definitely needed more chill in this week's reading from the book of Exodus. We have been following the Israelites through a long, seemingly endless journey through the desert on the way to freedom for a couple of weeks now. And this week, the Israelites are starting to complain. In fact, the text uses the word complain. In some translations, the word is grumble seven times. The Israelites were apparently doing a lot of grumbling. They are in the middle of their journey to who knows where, on who knows what timeline, and God's intrepid travelers are refusing to keep their concerns to themselves. They are not going to be quiet in the interest of harmony with each other and their leaders. They are no longer little cheerful purveyors of hope who say things like, we got this, or we can do hard things, or we're in this together. Instead, they complain. We're hungry. This is the worst. How many more minutes till we get there? I hate you. I wish I were never born. We wish we died as slaves in Egypt. At least we'd have full bellies and flesh pots. What makes it worse is that the Israelites are complaining to the people who led them out of slavery, the same people who promised them on God's behalf a life of freedom in a land flowing with milk and honey. They are complaining to Moses and Aaron, their leaders who helped God save them from Pharaoh's army and certain death. They are complaining to the people who helped them get free. You'd think they'd be more grateful. That's how much we humans hate the middle, right? Uncertainty is worse than death for us. We'd rather go back to a world in which we er were enslaved because at least it's a world we know and when we are scared, we look for someone to blame. And, oh yeah, on the pyramid of needs, food and water is at the bottom. It comes even before freedom. If you and I are starving, I'm guessing we'd complain too. Perhaps the only thing we dislike more than the middle is complainers. Complainers disrupt the status quo by telling the truth. Complainers remind us of everything that is wrong. Complainers remind us of everything that is unjust. Complainers make us feel uncomfortable. Complainers are demanding and they're annoying. Complainers often direct their complaints at people who don't deserve it for things that are entirely out of our control. We do not like complainers. And how we judge leaders often has to do with how they handle our complaints. Moses and Aaron know how to respond to complaining. First, they are self-differentiated. 
They don't personalize the Israelites' complaints by making it about them. Instead, they are clear about who owns the responsibility. Why, what are we that you complain against us, they say. Take it up with God who brought you out of slavery, they say. They also, though, don't shame the Israelites for their feelings or suggest that their complaints are invalid. Instead, they assure the whole congregation, God has heard you. God has heard your complaints. God hears the cries of God's people. God will respond. And then, God does hear the complaints of God's people, and God makes good on that promise. God listens, God listens, God empathizes, God responds by showering manna down from the sky, bread from heaven. They complained, and he brought quails and gave them food from heaven in abundance. He opened the rock and water gushed out. It flowed through the desert like a river. God doesn't call down from heaven, quit your whining, you entitled brats. God does not demand that we trudge along in the wilderness, shielding our feelings of frustration and fear from our creator. Instead, God receives our grumblings, God receives our complaints as a prayer. And then God rains down bread from heaven, from the sky. God listens, God remembers God's promise, and God responds. The psalmist says, God brings the people out singing. It's people, not God, who have a tendency to want to silence or shame the complainers. There are so many ways that we silence one another's complaints. There is this uh, psychological phenomenon that I've been reading about lately called toxic positivity. Have you been reading about this? I find it to be really prevalent right now, you all. Experts define toxic positivity as the excessive and ineffective overgeneralization of a happy, optimistic state across all situations. The process of toxic positivity results in the denial, minimization, and invalidation of the authentic human emotional experience. There is a dark side to positive vibes, amen? We, you and I, have to be careful during this pandemic that we don't participate in this kind of well-meaning cheerleading. Medical workers thrown into the trenches during the early days of COVID-19 were the quickest to point this phenomenon out. Do you remember this? They were angry. Stop telling me that I'm a superhero. I didn't sign up to be a hero. I just want to do my job and I want to come home to my children at night and I want to be healthy and I want to live. And if you want to support me, lobby your politicians to get me PPE. Do you remember that? And as a parent who just finished half a week of remote schooling after six months trying to work in a two earner family with all three of my kids home with me, it's only day three and I already know that something has got to give. I cannot sit by my first grader's side all day and do my job, right? And as a parent, when I tell the truth about this, I've noticed that there is either a resounding chorus of give it a chance, you got this, right? Or toxic negativity, why do you have kids if you didn't want to take care of them, right? And teachers have been saying for months that they don't understand how poorly ventilated, overcrowded buildings can be safe enough during a global pandemic to go back to work without risking their health. And when teachers complain, there is an overwhelming, resounding chorus of mostly toxic negativity. We pay you with our tax dollars, so get to work, right? 
And parents and teachers have been pitted against each other as if this COVID-19 pandemic is a war to be won. And I've noticed that every time in this, in this era of racial unrest, that every time black folks protest the ways they are unable to breathe because of the collective knee on their necks, there are some group of white folks telling them that they are complaining in the wrong way. The sacred gift of human life has become some sort of zero-sum game. If your life me matters, that must mean my life doesn't. That's not the way it works. And black folks and law enforcement officers have been pitted against each other as if this racism pandemic is a war to be won. We can't stand complainers because they are truth tellers. We can't abide the suffering of others because it triggers our own shame. But God listens. God loves. God responds. We are quick to say, don't tell the truth of your experience. It makes us uncomfortable and feel like we are being blamed. Or if I'm not experiencing what you experience, it must not be true. But God listens. God empathizes. God responds with bread from heaven. And if everyone just acted out of abundance and compassion the way God does and said, that sounds so hard, I'm so sorry to absolutely everyone who is hurting and lamenting in this wilderness time, maybe we'd survive this pandemic with our souls and our communities still intact. God listens, God empathizes, God responds, we can too. If Moses and Aaron had said to the complaining Israelites, quit whining, you entitled brats, you're lucky, you're free, and you should be thanking us for it, things might have been different. If Moses and Aaron responded to the Israelites' complaints with a resounding, you got this, when they are literally starving on an uncertain journey they aren't sure they'd see the end of, things might have been different. Moses and Aaron respond with empathy and assurance instead. God has heard you. You will be fed. They don't personalize it. They don't minimize it. They don't shame. They don't lie and suggest the rest of the journey will be easy. They don't use empty platitudes. They say instead, we hear you. God hears you. Look at what God has already done. Hold on to what God will do. God will make a way out of no way. God will use humans to do it. Look at what God has done here. God heard the complaints of the lonely, the scared, the isolated, and the church responded by raining down phone calls and cards and letters and food deliveries. God heard the complaints of a people who need to gather safely with one another to worship, and the church responded by gathering this amazing worship team to shepherd this congregation through this wilderness time. God heard the complaints of the hungry, and the church responded by raining down meals for our community on Monday afternoons at Food is Love. God heard the complaints of parents and grandparents and children, and the church responded by getting a permit from the state to open a child care center and after school for school-age kids on the weekdays. God heard the complaints of an overworked pastor and lay leaders and families crying out for ministry. And the search committee found us a new second pastor to companion us into the unknown future. Because God's love is extravagant and wasteful, God also sent us Kendra, Tiana, and Amberly as bonus gifts. Amen? God heard the complaints of the people in the wilderness. The church responds 
by saying, God has heard you. You will be fed. Beloved, when the complaining starts, let's start listening. We won't take it on as our baggage. We will take it on as prayers of lamentation. We won't compare it with our own suffering or treat it as a threat because empathy multiplies exponentially just like love. We won't shut down complaining or tell each other how to feel or minimize it because we know that God doesn't. God listens. God responds. We listen. We respond. We already have all we need. Ears to hear, a heart to love, and each other, which is manna straight from heaven. God makes a way out of no way. God will use us to do it. Amen.